Before you totally freak out, I know that if you're like most engineering students, your experience with differential equations is sort of like being repeatedly and ruthlessly bunny kicked over and over by your TA Serenity. But I'm telling you, I got you, stick with me. At the end of this video, you're gonna hopefully realize that in math, differential equations was, was really bad, but in engineering, when we have sort of a focused, like we're just trying to do just this one part, not everything, then it's not actually as bad as it was back in your math class. Two fully worked example problems, a second order linear ODE with a step function forcing function input, and a first order linear ODE with a ramp function as the, the forcing function input. And at the end of both examples, we're gonna identify the transient and steady state portions of the response. We'll solve these using no calculus, only Laplace transform tables and partial fraction decomposition. Start off by doing the forward Laplace transform to go from the time domain to the frequency domain, right? We're going from the T to S. And the nice thing about Laplace transforms is you get rid of derivatives and you get exponents. So we go from calculus to polynomials and algebra. Algebra is way better than calculus. So trust me, even if this seems rough, it really is better. So the second time derivative x double dot is gonna be an x squared term, but also as we see in this table, you also have to account for the initial condition. So we have a minus s x naught, this is the initial position, minus x dot of zero, the initial velocity. For the x dot term, that's s, x of s minus the initial position and the 10 x, x is just x. <laughs> so on the right hand side, 20, just a number becomes 20 times one over s. That's sort of like 20 times t to the zero. That's why we're using this n factorial over t to the n plus one. So it's sort of like a, a t to the zero power for 20. My goal is to get x of s by itself, right? Trying to solve for x. So I'm gonna cluster first all the x terms. So we've got s squared plus seven s plus 10. This is a characteristic equation. And then the initial condition terms are not multiplied by x. They can have s in them, but not x. So minus five s minus three minus 35. Those are the initial conditions. Uh, the 35, right, five times seven. And the right-hand side is still 20 times one over s. Before I move my initial conditions over, I wanna get rid of that one over s. If you leave it there, it'll still work out later on, but the algebra will be easier if we get rid of fractions. That seems very odd for me to say before later in this problem, we're gonna do partial fraction decomposition, but it's still a good idea to minimize fractions whenever possible. So I'm gonna multiply by S over. So now I've got X of S, S times a characteristic equation and 5S squared 38S equals 20. Take my initial conditions, move them over to the other side. So I've just got x of s is equal to, and save a little bit of time here, I'm gonna do the factoring right now. If you're in an engineering class and just doing a homework problem, we're probably gonna give you, even your evil professors are probably gonna give you factors that work out to be integers, because it's just a little bit easier than decimals. If it doesn't work out, you can just use quadratic equation to solve for the factors of your quadratic expression, but look at that middle term seven, and just check numbers that add up to seven, right? Six plus one, four plus two, three plus three, no, that's not right. Six plus one, five plus two, <laughs> four plus three. Um, so yeah, six times one is six, that's not 10. Five times two, uh, it equals 10. So S plus five and S plus two. So now the big division step, we take that all of those S, S plus five, S plus two terms, divide them over to the other side. We get that X of S is equal to five S squared, 38 S plus 20, the numerator, s, s plus five, s plus two in the denominator. And the reason I split that up in the, the denominator, I factored that out, is I was, I was thinking ahead, the next step is always going to be partial fraction decomposition. In order to do the inverse Laplace transform to go back to the time domain, you're gonna need to get fractions that exactly match your Laplace transform table. We don't wanna do any calculus. We are engineers. We just wanna look up numbers in tables, tables only. So we have to make our fractions exactly match the table. And there's nothing in the table about an S squared plus BS plus C or something like that, right? There's no like quadratic terms. 
we want to divide this up into like the easiest terms possible because we do have like one over s or one over s plus a terms. And since we have one over s and one over s plus a terms, my goal is to split this denominator up into three pieces. C1, one over s, C2, one over s plus two, C3, one over s plus five. Because going back to the time domain, that, that C1 is just gonna be a constant, right? One over s just leads to a constant. It's sort of like that, the n equals zero. The one over s plus two, the two is a, so that'll be C2e to the negative two t, and then C3e to the negative five t. So we're gonna have two exponential terms and one constant term in the final answer. Now all we have to do is solve for the coefficients, which is gonna be the most tedious, longest part of this problem. Yay, something to look forward to. To solve for the coefficients, we need to first make all of the denominators match. To do the algebra to actually solve, if you wanna add fractions together, you can only add fractions that have the same denominator. So for the, the one over s term, we have to multiply by s plus two, s plus five, divided by s plus two, s plus five. And the C2 term, since it has s plus two in the denominator, multiply by s times s plus five. So here for C3, you can see that once I've multiplied by s times s plus two, when I cancel out s and s plus two from the numerator, right? Because when you multiply those, s times s plus two divided by s plus s plus two, that's just one. So those cancel out and leaves with just C3 and s plus five, which is what we wanted. So that's check, right? That's, that's what we're looking for. And now that all four of these terms all have the same denominator, we can multiply by that denominator, which cancels it out and leaves us with just one equation with just the numerator parts left. So on the left-hand side, it's the 5s squared, 38s, and 20. On the right-hand side, it's gonna be C1, s squared, 7s, and 10, where I'm gonna actually like combine the two, the s plus three and s plus five. C2, s squared plus 5s, and C3, s squared plus 2s. At first, this looks horrible. We have three unknowns and only one equation. That is a problem. But just like a sum of forces in the x and y direction, you can separate them. Just like adding sine and cosine terms, you can separate those. We can separate these s terms based on powers of s. So I'm gonna rewrite this one equation into three different equations where I group all of the s squared terms in one row, the s to the first power terms, and the s to the zero, like just the numbers in the third row. So there's five s squared is equal to C1, C2, and C3. There's a s squared term in all three of those. The 38 s is equal to seven C1, five C2, two C3, because again, there's an s term in all three equations. But for just the numbers, there's 20 on the left-hand side, and then 10 C1 on the right, and that's it. The C2 and C3 don't have a number term. So right off the bat, we get C1 is equal to two. That leaves two equations, and two unknowns. So I can rewrite this in matrix form where I'm plugging in C1 equals two. So five minus two, so C2 plus C3 is gonna be three. And five C2 plus two C3 is equal to 38 minus seven times two, so that's 24. Plug this into my calculator. I've got a TI-36X Pro, which has the system solver. If you can't do two equations and two unknowns on your calculator. Like if you don't know how to solve this matrix problem on your calculator, definitely look that up. Just pause this video, go to another window and look up how to solve a system of equations on my calculator. Um, this is gonna save you so much time in, in your college career. This, this sort of operation just comes up all the time. But type that in, calculator gives me C2 equal to six, C3 equal to negative three. And in red up here at the top of the screen, you can see I already solved for, like I already did the inverse Laplace transform earlier. Back when I was just deciding which fractions to use, that's when I did the inverse Laplace transform. You don't wanna wait till the very end to do it because if you wait till the very end, what if you solve for a fraction that's not in the table? Then you have to start back at the beginning and redo everything. So I can just plug in these coefficients in that red equation that I already found. Final answer for x of t, this is the general response, is two plus, 6e to the minus 2t minus 3e to the minus 5t. And this can be divided into transient response and steady state response. The transient response are the two decreasing exponential terms, the e to the minus a t. If you plug in like t equals a million, both of these terms are gonna equal zero. 
right? As time goes on, a decrease in exponential, an e to the negative power, as time gets bigger, that is gonna decrease down to zero. That's what makes this the transient response, that when time is small, when you plug in a small value for t, then this term is gonna be important and it's gonna meaningfully influence x. But when time is very large, these two terms are gonna to go to zero and have almost no impact on x. So in fact, for this problem, the steady state response is just gonna be two. Your system is gonna settle in to exactly two at the end. And if you look back at the initial equation, what you might notice is that the forcing function was 20 and the linear force was 10x. And 20 divided by 10 is two, and that's not a coincidence. Imagine in steady state, like if, imagine if this object is not moving. Then if it's not changing in time, then your x dot and x double dot terms are gonna be zero and your 10x should equal 20. So your x position should end up being two so that the 10x is gonna directly counter the 20. So if this is like a mass spring damper system and you're pulling on it with a force of 20, even though it's gonna bounce a little bit, eventually it's gonna settle so that the spring force 10x is gonna exactly equal the 20 that I'm pulling on it with. And this can often be a way to check and make sure your final answer sort of makes sense. If you think you're learning anything in this video and maybe you're a little bit less intimidated by differential equations than you were before, maybe consider hitting the thumbs up button. Your TA Serenity stopped with the bunny kicks after all. Maybe it seems a little bit less like you're being constantly pummeled. And maybe this seems like something that, that you're actually gonna be able to do and be successful at. Second example problem, a first order differential equation this time, meaning x dot is the highest uh, derivative term. But now we've got 4t on the right hand side, a ramp function, right? It's a, like a, a line, a linear line <laughs> that's increasing with the slope of four. So the forward Laplace transform, the left hand side is kind of the same as before, the x dot term s times x of s minus the initial position plus seven x becomes seven x of s. But the right hand side, 4t, when we check the Laplace transform table, we see that there's a t to the n is equal to n factorial over s to the n plus one. So we have t to the first power, so we're using n equals one. So t to the one is equal to one factorial over s to the one plus one, so one over s squared. So the four is still a four, and the t is one over s squared in the frequency domain. I'm gonna to group together my x of s terms on the left-hand side, so it's s plus seven. The minus five initial condition is still there, and then four over s squared on the right-hand side. Just the same as before, I wanna get rid of that s squared term, though. Uh, again, there's gonna be a million fractions later on. I want to minimize the number of fractions for right now, and so multiplying the s squared is gonna simplify the problem a little bit to make it all kind of level. So the left-hand side now has s squared, s plus seven, minus five s squared equals four. Take the, the initial condition term and now subtract that over to the other side. To, so I can get x of s by itself by taking s squared s plus seven, dividing it under, and I get x of s, five s squared plus four over s squared plus seven. Now the part that most students are gonna make a mistake on for this problem besides everything else is gonna be to want to do a partial fraction decomposition of just two terms s squared and s plus seven. But when you have a repeated root, a repeated factor, right, something in your denominator that's raised to a power, you have to include every lower power as well, building up to it. So your partial fraction expansion, partial fraction decomposition has to be c1, one over s, c2, one over s squared, c3, one over s plus seven. You need both one over s and one over s squared. And the reason you need both is that you can't be sure what the final answer behavior is gonna look like. You can't be sure whether you have like a t squared term or just like two t terms or like a t to the zeroth term that all kind of stack up and add up to s squared. So since you don't know whether you have the s squared or a couple of smaller s's that built up to it, you have to include all of them it's possible that some of these coefficients may end up being zero or you may end up needing all of them. So you have to keep all of them just in case 
And that's definitely the most common mistake students would make on this problem, not including the one over S fraction. I'm gonna do the inverse Laplace transform now. Again, get some of that sweet, sweet partial credit in case I mess up mistakes later on. I wanted to show like, hey, I at least knew how to finish this problem. The one over S term is just gonna become a constant C1. One over S squared is gonna become a T term. So C2 times T. And the S plus seven term is gonna become a negative exponential. Uh, C3E to the negative seven T where A is seven. And now I just need to solve for the coefficients doing partial fraction decomposition. One of my least favorite things, just, I don't know, the more often you do it, maybe it doesn't actually seem quite so bad, but it's still really intimidating when you get, when you, when you get going. This is those bunny kicks, right? You just feel like you're kind of getting pummeled having to do this every time. But once you do it enough, you, you start to get kind of immune to it. Maybe your serenity, your TA serenity and the bunny kicks starts feeling kind of cute. It's like, oh, partial fraction expansion, how sweet. So first step towards finding coefficients is you actually have to make your fractions all have the same denominator. You, if you wanna add fractions together, you have to have the same denominator to add fractions together. So the C1, one over S needs to get multiplied by S, S plus seven, in order to make the denominator S squared, S plus seven. The C2 term needs to get multiplied by S plus seven because it already has an S squared in the denominator. And the C3 term just needs to get multiplied by S squared because it already has an S plus seven in the denominator. Once the denominators are all equal, you can cancel out the denominator, left with just the numerator, five S squared plus four on the left, C1 S squared plus seven, C2 S plus seven, C3 S squared. And again, this looks like one equation three unknowns, but we can split it up into three different equations, an S squared term, an S to the first term, and S to the zero term. S to the zero is like just the regular numbers. Oh, and of course, and as I started to write this out, I caught that I definitely have a typo in here, that S squared, that the C1 expression should be S squared plus seven S, right? The S distributes in and multiplies by the seven also. That would super have messed me up if I didn't catch that. So my S squared equation, five is C1 plus C3. I've got zero for the S, and then my S to the zero is just four equals seven C2, and there's only one coefficient. So I can actually solve for C2 right off the bat. Four sevenths is C2. And then when C2 is known, I can actually plug that into the middle equation and get the C1 is negative four divided by 49. I had to actually double check this math. It looked like the sevens were gonna cancel. I wanted to call this negative four, but no, it's actually the sevens multiply. So negative four over 49 for C1. So C3 is gonna be five plus four over 49. And you know what? I think I've had it about up to here with all of the fractions. I'm going to decimal form with this 5.082. Engineers work in decimals, not fractions. So, I am going back to decimals, even though we're at the very last step, it's about time, no more fractions, I can't do even one more. 5.082 for C3, and we can plug these into the forward Laplace transform that we already did before, right? This is that black X of T equation up above. So C1 is negative four over 49, then plus four sevenths T, plus 5.082 E to the negative seven T, using decimals because we're engineers and we're allowed to use decimals. So steady state versus transient. The transient solution is your negative exponential, the decreasing, the five to the e to the negative seven t. That is the transient solution. That's the part that's gonna go away, right? As t approaches infinity, this is going to approach zero. The other two parts, four over 49 and the four over seven t, that is your steady state solution. Those parts do not disappear as time increases. Now the negative four over 49 is gonna become much smaller relatively as compared to four sevenths T, right? As T gets huge, four sevenths T is gonna be huge and four over 49 is still gonna be pretty tiny. But four over 49 is never going to be zero. It's always gonna be four over 49. So since it does not go towards zero, it's part of the steady state solution, even though it'll become less important than the four sevenths T, right? The ramp function is gonna keep ramping upwards. The 449 still gets to be part of the steady state solution. Now I said I was done with fractions and ready to move on to just using decimals, but if you want some more practice doing partial fraction decomposition, that's the video linked up on the screen here and that would be the best one for you to watch next.